Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, especially we have uh, a talk from work from Barfus, work here, uh, that's going to talk about intrinsic fluctuations in reinforcement learning promote cooperation. For anyone that doesn't know Wolf, uh, Wolf is the uh, the new Argelander professor in, in the transdisciplinary research area of sustainable futures at the University of Bonn, Germany. Uh, his research blends ideas from complex system science, multi agent enforcement learning, and social ecological resilience. Before joining the University of Bonn, he completed his doctorate at the Boston Institute of, for Climate Impact Research on Humboldt Universitat zu Berlin. He also went on to work as a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics in Science in Leipzig. Uh, the School of Mathematics at the University of Leeds in the UK and the Tübingen AI Center at the, Tün at the University of Tübingen. Uh, and then, well, without any further ado, uh, let's uh, give a warm welcome to, to Wolf. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Manfred, for this kind of production and overall the invitation to speak here today. So my learning goals or milestones for this talk are threefold. First, uh, I'd like you to recognize current challenges of uh, collective action problems. Then how a bridging multi-agent reinforcement learning and complex system science can help with these challenges. And third, how this you know, general approach applies to a specific problem of intrinsic noise or intrinsic fluctuations in reinforcement learning. And I want to do a little bit of an experiment today because I thought these uh, online talks could uh, maybe gain some uh, um, benefit from a little bit of interactivity. So um, I'm inviting you to uh, join this, this participate page. It's a bit like Mentimeter for those of you who know this. I pa paste the link also in the chat. Um, and then, you know, we, we can have some little bit of collective intelligence in uh, uh, of our 12 sized or 11 sized collective. So the people are joining, that's great. Maybe you have to deactivate a content blocker sometimes. That was an issue for me. Um, and to test, so of course you don't have to, but uh, you're warmly invited. Um, and if that works just as a test, what time of day is it for you right now? If you could answer that question real quick. We have four answers already, six. Let's wait a little longer to sort out the technical issues. Hey, I'm sorry, how are we supposed to vote again? Um, so you, you go on the link in the chat and then you should see the question. Does it work for you, Ron? Yeah, just a second. Yes, it did work, thank you. Perfect. So let's look at the results. So even quite, distributed. I didn't imagine that, but of course, obviously, maybe since it's a Berkeley seminar, most of you, it's for you, it's in the morning, but even some, probably one, uh, for one person, it's it's in the night, maybe. Yeah, let's see. Okay, cool. So that works. Fantastic. Um, so to start with the first, why is it? To start with the first uh, goal, recognize current challenges for collective action. And I want to hear, start really broad 
and for me, really the challenge of the first 21st century is prospering. So this, uh, uh, there, there was a comment in the chat. So really the, the challenge for me, for, for all of us, for humanity in the 21st century is prospering within planetary boundaries. So limiting the impact we have on the Earth system and critical processes like the climate system, but also biodiversity, freshwater, land system change within their safe limits and stay below this ecological foundation, the ceiling. But on the other hand, we want basic human needs fulfilled, like the income, food, health. So we want to have a little bit of pressure on the Earth system and stay within that safe and just operating space, fulfilling all the sustainability, sustainable development goals and stay away on a path safely away from uh, catastrophic tipping elements. And the crucial question is, I don't know what's happening. How do you enter this? And here, of course, it's clear we need urgent and large scale collective action. So what are the challenges for that large scale and rapid collective action? First of all, it's that we have large author large collectives. So we don't have outside authorities that can enforce uh, the, the, the cooperation through, through uh, you know, institutions, incentives, but also, you know, bottom up um, approaches like through, through peer reciprocity or peer punishment are obviously not working that well. Then we have intelligent behavior, uh, adaptive cognition within the individual, which can also be uh, are diverse in their abilities and their preferences and often have multiple objectives to, to fulfill. Then we have changing dynamic environments on the other side, where the consequences of our actions are often delayed. There's a lot of things we could do, so a huge search space. It's not always clear what the right thing is, so we have sparse, sparse rewards, and even uh, additionally some uncertainty on uh, the actual state of, 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 of the environment. And not to forget, uh, with these three components, also there we need to look at the dynamics of collective action, because you know stability and resilience concepts from the sustainability side are um, rooted in a dynamic picture. When we think of critical transitions, also dynamic concepts, um, and overall we're interested in the transient behavior, not just uh, an learned equilibrium so in the you know sustainability community we also like to call this uh, uh, interconnectedness of, of actors and environments coupled social ecological system where the idea is that we can't really separate one without looking at the other all right so much to the challenges now how can multi-agent reinforcement learning and complex system system science help with that and the crucial point is that we need mathematical modeling for that task uh, empirical approaches cannot do the full job here and so mathematical models are instrumental for theory building and also in silico experimentation and the key point here is that we have two types of mathematical modeling approaches, complex system science, where the idea is that we find often complex behavior emerging from very simple rules and simple interactions between the agents. And we have multi-agent reinforcement learning, um, where, where we have multiple reinforcement learning in a shared environment. And here I invite you to go back to the question uh, setting to the question page and answer in one of the following areas do you have a decent understanding of the basics so what is your background are you kind of an um, expert in multi-agent reinforcement learning complex system science both or maybe you're a beginner and um, 
they're just interested in, in, in hearing, learning more about them. So let's see if we get it to eight. Let's give a couple of more seconds. Great, so I think eight is the magic number today. So let's look at the results. So fantastic. Uh, that was a bit like I expected in a multi-agent learning seminar. So um, you, you, you are more from the moral side. So we have a question in chat. Yeah, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, is complex system science a superset of Wolfram's cellular automata? So that, I mean, obviously that's not me, the Wolfram, that's the Stephen Wolfram. Um, and I, 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 I would think so. I mean, um, that, that Wolfram's work is rooted within the idea and was very influential in the community of, of complex system science, exactly. Great. So let's get back to the presentation. And the question, why are we contrasting these two? So complex system science has the advantage that it's quite insightful. So it produced a rich understanding on how cooperation can emerge. I mean, did other things like maybe uh, Wolfram's work is a good example of, but also specifically on the aspect of cooperation with evolutionary, ga evolutionary game theory and the evolution of cooperation um, produced a rich set of insights. But on the other hand, like a bit of a downside is that because of that idea of how that complexity emerges from simple things, it ignores to a large degree that individuals can also be complex themselves and that there is environmental context that's important. So it might be a bit too simplistic to cover the aspects we need. Multi-agent reinforcement learning, on the other hand, is very rich. So it is a framework where we can, can combine collectives of individually intelligent agents in shared changing dynamic environments. Problem with uh, reinforcement learning, especially in the multi-agent cases, that it can be a bit of obscure, like that's the one word I found to, to summarize what I mean, which is it's highly stochastic, can be computationally quite expensive, and also a bit challenging to interpret. So and that is the stage where we argue, and by the way, this is uh, based on a, 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 a paper we are writing, which is hopefully close to submission now, um, with a wonderful set of co-authors. Um, this sets the stage uh, that these two branches of science are actually kind of made to complement each other. So how can we build bridges between them? So in a nutshell, uh, we treat uh, the multi-agent reinforcement learning framework as a dynamical system. Yes? I'm not sure that people you know, like is, you know, You're cut out a little bit. I didn't, didn't understand the full question, unfortunately. Okay, I think or it's on my end. To comment. So please ignore. Uh, I was saying that I think your mic is cutting out, but now it's not so apologies okay uh please continue do do others do others uh, hear my mic cutting out as well um, no you're fine I'm okay okay cool all right so first stop we treat model as a dynamic system then we can look at complex emerging phenomena happening in the world and this gives us an integrated platform to study cooperation promoting mechanisms and the different aspects we looked at. And I will go through this very briefly. This is just to give you an idea. And then we focus on the specific aspect uh, of intrinsic fluctuation, which I thought is a bit more concrete and tangible. So modeling the collective dynamics emerging from multi-agent reinforcement learning, uh, I'd like to call collective reinforcement learning dynamics because the 
collective is a bit more associated to the to the complex systems side so it blends the two 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 fields in in, in a in a decent way and the idea is um that we use the same framework from multi-agent reinforcement learning where we have agents they have actions to choose from we have an environment with different states they observe the uh, rewards and observations from the environment and have this interaction loop on the one side where they assess real prediction error and on the other side kind of this adaptation process where they use that information to change their policies over time to gain more reward and all the different kind of ways you could do that but the crucial point is um, that we basically average out the stochasticity of that system and use um, mean field approximations of that. So, so mean field approximation is also, I mean, one word to call it. Uh, there's the link to evolutionary game theory or uh, stochastic approximations if you're coming from the more mathematical uh, background. But the basic idea is that we gain a, a, a pretty unifying, integrating picture on equation-based modeling on the dynamic side, equilibrium-based modeling, if we're looking at the equilibria that emerge, where the dynamics converge to, when they converge, um, and also for the agent-based modeling, since we have this access to, to agent dynamics. And this is really inspired from a lot of ideas branching from economics, machine learning, statistical physics, and also mathematical biology. We can use that to look at complex emerging phenomena like different dynamic regimes, which show that uh, learning doesn't have to converge all the time as here in the blue trajectory. It can have unpredictable chaotic dynamics, which is done relatively often. Uh, look at multi-stability that can emerge and the consequences of that. Abrupt transitions in the you know, model parameter space and also hysteresis effects, which is a kind of an history dependence in the overall MAL system. These are the kind of complex systems phenomena we look at. And um, I said, apologies for not going into detail if, if that is what you're looking for. Um, instead, just highlighting okay, that this kind of combined approach gives us a tool to look at the cooperation promoting mechanisms in large and heterogeneous collectives, individual cognition, environmental context, and also from a dynamic angle. All right, so how does this perspective help us now on the specific aspect of intrinsic fluctuations? And so this is now based on a paper together with Janusz Meilan, um, and we started out from the basic question, the simple question, can just the simple basic reinforcement learning algorithms cooperate? Because on the one hand, like from the complex system sites, uh, evolutionary game theory with a range of mechanisms promoting cooperation. But we found that the conditions under which agents learn to cooperate are contested in the literature. So we have some works that suggest that independent reinforcement learning agents are capable of spontaneously cooperating without explicit intent to do so. Whereas other works suggest or argue that the emergence of cooperation from independently learning agents is rather unlikely and therefore specific algorithmic features are required to boost and promote cooperation. So where do we stand? And so to investigate this question, you know, from like the most basic principles, the idea is that we look at a very simple system, a simplistic system, if you are more from the large scale mouse side, but that is kind of the, the complex systems approach that uh, we'd like to do, like what is the minimal set of assumptions we need? And very prominently studied is the iterated prisoner's dilemma here with memory one strategy so we have two agents they exert a joint action on that you know 
prisoner's dilemma environment, which I'm sure all of you know. Each agent can cooperate and defect, and you know everyone has an incentive to defect regardless of what the others are doing. Um, but both would be better off if both were cooperating. And T and S, the temptation and the suckers pay of other parameters we can set in that environment. And so um, in the agents, uh, we have their value space, which is updated with the reward and the state information, the discount factor uh, delta here, and also the learning rate. And we look here specifically um, at policies uh, of epsilon greedy type. So we have this ex exploration rate epsilon, which then, you know, transforms the, the value space into the actual strategy or policy with whom uh, the agents can play. So now if we use a simple, you know, SARSA Q learning type of algorithm and let them run, we see that over a period of time, the fraction of trajectories that goes to cooperation increases. And the question is why? And here I invite you again in the interactive platform to brainstorm a little bit. Like, let's, let's take one minute and just enter factors that you think are most relevant for these reinforcement learning agents to learn to cooperate. So let's give us one minute to contemplate. Any more thoughts and the answers? All right. Let's look at what we have here. Chance, reward, maximizations, explorations, reward functions, conventions, learning rate, common interest, discount factor. Yes, I think those are all good points that play a role um policy capacity um we will speak um so i won't cover all in the in the next slides but we look at the learning rate the exploration exploitation trade-off and the discount factor so this is all covered great So the way we'd like to we approach this was what we call by dissecting the, the reinforcement learning process. What do we mean by that? We first look at the stability of strategies or policies. That's the same thing um, uh, for us under reinforcement learning. And there we found that only one of three possible strategies, stable strategies, support cooperation robustly. In a second step, we look kind of the learnability of the cooperative equilibrium, which is uh, adjusting the learning rate. And here we saw, okay, 40 to 50% of cooperation uh, with deterministic learning dynamics. That's that kind of mean field approach I mentioned earlier. And then in the third step, I have a very sensitive keyboard here. Uh, we looked at the stochasticity of the reinforcement learning process, where we, um, you know, uh, moved away from this extreme assumption of hiding all the stochasticity in the learning process, and actually uh, let the stochasticity um, 
uh, 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 completely go away. And there we found that we, we, we gained up to, you know, 80, even 100% of cooperation without much parameter tuning. Uh, Manfred, you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, I was curious, how do you determine the learnability of the cooperative equilibrium? The, the what? The, the learnability? The learn learnability, yes. Yes, so we will we will get to that. So this, this was the overview, and now I'm going into each of the points specifically. So let's first start with the stability. And this, um, you know, Janusz calculated uh, with pen and paper, and I think uh, um, some some algebra, mathematical algebra system. Here in the parameter space, spanned by the discount factor or the discount rate, I think it should it should call the discount factor, but it's the discount factor, not the discount rate. And the exploration rate, epsilon. And what we see is, and this is, you know, for, for this specific set of environmental param parameters, but uh, those are not, um, you know, uh, uh, too important. We also did it for a different set, and you see similar picture for the chalk. It's sufficient to look just at, at one. And here we saw that, um, all the fact grim trigger and wind stability, those are three specific strategies, are stable. So all D in black means that they are stable all in, in the whole the parameter space. And all D means simply uh, we always play the fact, of course. Then in the blue region, grim trigger is stable. And grim trigger is like all D, but when both um, cooperated in the last round, then they keep on cooperating. Now, the problem with Grim Trigger is that as soon as they explore, like in the have a non-zero exploration rate, then they won't cooperate all the time, and then they will lose cooperation. That's why when they lose shift, which is basically a Grim Trigger, instead when both defected, so lost, they shift um, again, to cooperation. Um, so the green region is the only region in the parameter space where cooperation can um, could possibly emerge from this stability point of view. Now, under what conditions does it actually is it actually learned? So, and here we use these deterministic learning dynamics, which are computationally quite nice because uh, it only the only source of, of variation we have here in these plots is the initial conditions. So we uh, sampled, uh, I think it was 250 initial conditions in the whole strategy space and looked at how many of those enter the win, stay, lose, shift equilibrium and also the others for reference, but really the green plot is the most important one. And here you see that um, when they have an, a learning rate of one, which you could think is actually uh, sufficient because they integrate all the knowledge in their update. Uh, so a learning rate of one could actually work. Uh, it doesn't, so they don't learn. Uh, instead, only by, you know, slightly moving in the direction of the best response they can learn where we get kind of a maximum of cooperation around 50 percent um, for this learning rate and exploration rate combination at 0 0.01 okay but the exact parameters are not um too important main point here is it's still far off of that very high level of cooperation we saw in the just um uh, naive approach of letting the the, the standard algorithm run. so we thought okay there must be a third element and that we found in the stochasticity of the learning and for the stochasticity we use kind of a memory sample batch approach of the reinforcement learning which is quite common um where the agents keep on you know, interacting, or it's also a bit related to, to model-based uh, learning. 
with the same policy. And by that, they reduce the stochasticity of, of that single update to a certain degree. And here we here you see a plot of um, where we use batch sizes controlling the stochasticity in the order of uh, thousands. And here we see that we can get the wind state shift strategy um, in the order of you know 80 percent even a bit more maybe if we would run it longer or in other settings it's it's even higher and crucially also 10 times faster than without the memory approach so what does this mean well on the one side we saw that imperfect information in learning is not at all an evil they are actually a crucial asset though. Imperfect information in the form of intrinsic fluctuations is critical to learn mutually high rewarding cooperation. But also we saw this inherent trade-off between the learning time to reach that high level of cooperation and that and the learning outcome. So we should focus more also on you know the path, the transient dynamics to the outcome, um, not only on the learning um, um learning end all right so now to summarize or before i summarize my talk i invite you again and this is just maybe for for me personally i won't share the answers so you can be very free here i give you one minute the one thing you learned during the talk if you do that, that would be very helpful to get a bit of, uh, you know, feedback. Then I summarize and we close and can open the discussion. Yeah, Pranay has a question. Hey, um, I apologize if I missed this, but uh, just the setting that this is in, is it uh, fully observable, partially observable? Um, so this is... And that's, that's really um, a big question. So it's fully observable. Um, and the state space, if you will, is that memory one um setting in the prisoner's dilemma so agents do not learn more complicated strategies or try to assess which are the best uh you know representative states to choose actions build. it's just this memory one strategy space fully observable okay thanks all right great so then let's summarize uh, in a nutshell I presented you today that building bridges between complex system science and multi-agent reinforcement learning or is, is a good thing to do to address the challenges around cooperative intelligence. Um, we looked at the challenges around large and heterogeneous collectives, individual cognition, environmental context, and also the dynamics. And, um, you know, briefly, uh, touched upon how both can be this integrated framework to look at these challenges, you know, from the complex systems point of view, but also from the mild view, scaling it all up again. And then specifically, uh, we looked at the effects of intrinsic noise or intrinsic fluctuations in reinforcement learning. I thought, okay, these are obviously key to, to um, one aspect making just independent reinforcement learner learners cooperate so with that i just want to advertise a position i'm currently advertising as a doctor researcher so if you find this interesting or maybe you know someone who is looking for a phd position 
and uh, this could be an, a good thing uh, for them, then please tell them. Um, you find all the information on my website, or just please write me an email. And uh, with that, I give a shout out to, to my co authors on the various faces, colleagues, and most of all, to you. And now, of course, we can open the discussion. Um, but I would also be very grateful if you could answer the, the question during the discussion, maybe, or why you think of a question, what was the most unclear point for you during that talk? Thank you very much. So a virtual club, <laughs> so we don't mm -hmm. have any other, any other means. Um, so I wonder if anyone has any questions. I think Pranay has one. Hmm. Disregard. I I meant to clap. I saw the hand. Oh. And, okay. Uh... Yeah. yeah, it's, it's <laughs> the other hand. It's in the, Thank you. In the reactions. Um. There we go. So anyone has any questions? So I do have one. Um. So how do you? um see this um so usually when when people hear of complex science systems the talk generally is around agent-based modeling mm -hmm. uh, mostly like simulation based uh, studies of, of complex systems how do you see this integration of complex science systems and and reinforcement learning or multi-end reinforcement learning playing out in the future in general um so i mean ideally in the future the research could be much more integrated you know and also open uh, in the sense of um trying to understand what you know the other field has you know as as part of of their goals of doing research which is happening so subconsciously that when you're in one field maybe you don't realize that this is actually what we always do but um, for an outsider, you first have to understand and realize, okay, this is what they do. This is what they're interested in. And so ideally, you know, the, the raising awareness just about these different goals and different methodologies, different scope um, is the first step to, to then have the research more integrated. And um, so for example, uh, in the case of agent-based modeling you mentioned, I would say that, you know, agent-based modeling is one set of approaches and tools and multi-agent reinforcement learning is kind of another field and they overlap at some aspects. So we have multi-agent reinforcement learning that is maybe not agent-based modeling when we have a more engineering um, control type of question and we have agent-based modeling that is not multi-agent reinforcement learning um, but one advantage i see of using multi-agent reinforcement learning as a type of agent-based modeling is uh, the the linkages to game theory and that uh, you know agents have are driven by motivations and not just purely by a behavior that is specified and this is key to assess, you know, when the conditions change, will the behavior change as well, or will it stay the same? This, I think you can only do if you have a setting where you specify the behavior on the level of motivations or reward or utility or however you want to call it. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, we have uh, Pranay as a question. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Wolfram. So, uh, some of the kind of summary just overarchingly between um, the mean field approximations and, and multi-agent RL. Um, so it seems like the mean field approximations are a valuable tool in simplifying complex interactions and, and can help enable scalable learning uh, and, and in places where multi-agent RL might be much less computationally or sample efficient to do so. Uh, it seems like it allows researchers to model and analyze um, 
these larger and larger scale multi-agent systems in a more computational uh, feasible way. But um, do you find that there's potentially a trade-off of potentially losing some of the details of say inter individual interactions between agents um, or some like nuance that, that may be important? Uh, do you see that being a, a potential risk in in certain situations um you can either in silico or in the real world um absolutely so i you know there there's definitely a risk of of losing an important detail if you average something or if you um look at something from an aggregate level um but I think it's a trade-off to some extent, you know, because um, it's also not obvious that all the details matter. So that's exactly the scientific question behind this, this bridge, you know, which details matter, to what mm -hmm. extent, and which maybe not. So um, maybe I can illustrate this with these types of phenomena, we, we looked at here with these, you know, deterministic dynamics as representative uh, features studied in the literature. And most works actually look at, you know, chaotic dynamics in types of reinforcement learning equations. And it just occurred to me recently that this is actually, I'm not so sure how this translates to, you know, more real world uh, uh, re reinforcement learning algorithms when you have stochasticity. Because I, I talked once with a researcher who, who's, who's re researching that, said that she doesn't even, uh, she doesn't even know if, if it's okay to say that there is stochastic chaotic systems. So what does chaos mean in stochastic systems? Apparently a deep interesting question that um, we don't know. So you could think there's an imprint of chaotic dynamics when you have stochasticity, but what exactly happened, not so sure. These other types of multi-stability transitions will also change if you lose some of the um, simplifying assumptions, but especially, you know, transitions between different game theoretic regimes and the type of behavior you would see there, uh, I could, I could, you know, have a, have a more positive feeling that those features will also carry on to um, the larger scale systems, but it's up to be determined. So here really the point is, we see these on small scale. Can can we also learn something uh, and observe them on a larger scale? And I think looking at the level of noise and stochastic uh, reinforcement learning, stochastic like reinforcement learning as a stochastic dynamic system is really key here to 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 see like how intrinsic fluctuations change these phenomena. Yeah, thank you. I, I think uh, one of the first points you made was very interesting, which was, uh, can we make this less of a trade-off in somehow identifying what details would be lost that are important? Um, that seemed very interesting to me. Cool. Yeah. Um, we have another question on the chat. Uh, Eva says, I hope we pronounced the name right, is asking, how can the principles of cooperation learn from temporal difference reinforcement learning in the iterative precedence dilemma be adapted to enhance our multitask like navigation in various dynamically challenged and dynamically changing environments? Um. So, uh my first response would be that navigation 
um, it's probably maybe a different task. So of course you could use the same tools to study you know, navigation. I did in a toy example for a project that didn't lead to much yet where I specifically looked at, you know, intrinsic motivations of novelty or curiosity of these types of things and really could see how this, uh, you know, improves navigation capabilities in, in, a, in a sort of small maze. Uh, but I can't see now the, um, like an uh, obvious connection how cooperation helps with navigation because here cooperation we 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 look at uh, more in the sense of a social dilemma you know averting the social dilemma to some extent which is you know in a way you could see when you are in a in a memory one setting then actually coordination becomes coordinating on the wind daily shift strategy and maybe coordination is something where in a multi-agent setting navigation um, could 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 work better in coordinating information on where to go but um, i don't know maybe you want to um specify the question or that that's good i don't know yeah well, that, that sounds great. Um, I'm going to stop the recording right now. Um, if people want to to keep like chatting with uh, Wolf, uh, we will still more than welcome. Um,